Welcome to an exhilarating journey into the depths of ancient Egypt's mysteries. Today, we set out to uncover the enigma and secrets of Pyramid GIA, a structure equally as significant as Pharaoh Khufu's Great Pyramid. Enthusiasts of archaeology and mysteries alike join us in exploring this ancient marvel, where numerous secrets and questions await. In this video, we will delve into the details of Pyramid GIA, a structure that sparks curiosity and debate among archaeologists. We'll reveal the unique architectural design that takes us on a thrilling voyage into the cultural and engineering depths of this pharaonic masterpiece. By examining the intricate architectural layout of Pyramid GIA, we will explore its distinctive features and shed light on the ongoing discussions among experts regarding this mysterious structure. We'll uncover the secrets of its pyramidical composition and collectively ponder the challenges it presents. Let's embark together on a world of excitement and exploration as the research community delves into the exploration of Pyramid GIA, directing their attention towards ancient secrets waiting to be unveiled. Stay tuned for this thrilling expedition into the realms of archaeology and mystery within the depths of Pyramid GIA. Unraveling the Enigma of GIA, the architectural puzzle of Khufu's Pyramid Complex. There's a fascinating debate among Egyptologists about the origins and purpose of Pyramid GIA. Some believe it was originally designated as GIX and later moved, raising questions about its connection to Hetep Heres and the possibility of a shift in the king's plans. In Mark Lenner's work, the connection between Hetep Heres shaft G7000X and Pyramid GIX is highlighted. Lenner proposes that when the decision was made to relocate GIX to GIA, Hetep Heres' body was moved as well, complete with new funerary equipment. However, Lenner also introduces an intriguing alternative theory. He suggests that when Khufu expanded his mortuary temple, the satellite pyramid over the trial passages was abandoned. Could GIA have been chosen as the new satellite pyramid, with Hetep Heras potentially assigned to GIB? Lenner points out the absence of temple remains near GIA, proposing that such features may not be necessary for a satellite pyramid. The nearby causeway, however, makes GIA vulnerable to stone robbers leading to a sequence of stone robbing, with GIC being the best preserved. Fast forward to 1991, and a new player enters the scene, Small Pyramid GID, now considered by Lena as Khufu's satellite pyramid. This discovery raises the question, should we expect a temple associated with GIA, or does it strengthen the case for a different attribution? As we see outside the entrance to GIA today, a sign attributes it to Hetep Heres, but Reisner suggests it belonged to Meritetis. The function and attribution of these minor pyramids remain shrouded in the dense fog of confusion, awaiting the lucky turn of a spade to shed more light on these ancient mysteries. In this captivating image captured by John Bodsworth, the northwest corner of GIA comes into view. Notice the gradual destruction of the pyramids from north to south set against the somewhat uneventful topography of the site. The entire plateau slopes down from northwest to southeast. In the foreground, fragments of basalt catch our attention. These remnants were once part of Khufu's temple court, which was paved with basalt. The temple has been cut down to match the level of the inner pyramid court, and the causeway has been similarly adjusted to connect to the temple. This alteration left a distinctive ridge of rock upon which GIA was constructed, visible above the surrounding landscape. Now, the elevated positioning of GIA has sparked disagreement among Egyptologists regarding whether the temple or the pyramid was constructed first. Lenner and Horus argue one perspective, while Peter Jano C., an expert on Queen's pyramids, offers a differing view. Lenner and Horus suggest, it is difficult to date the many mastabas built under Khufu's reign. They propose that the builders evolved the temple and causeway plans after commencing the construction of GIA. The differently worked bedrock surfaces, they argue, are evidence of this evolving design during the course of construction. In contrast, Reisner presents an intriguing perspective on the construction timeline. He suggests that the cores of three nuclear cemeteries in the western field were built during Cheops' reign, with construction beginning before year five of the king and continuing until the end of his reign. In the image before us, we witness the original 12 cores of Cemetery G7000, neatly arrayed behind the minor pyramids. It is suggested that this complex was completed around the 17th year of Khufu's reign, emphasizing the significance of these structures in honoring important courtiers and family members. The construction of Mastabas during Khufu's reign is no surprise. 
Courtiers and family members needed tombs, with the Eastern Cemetery reserved for more immediate family, such as Prince Kawab, believed to be Kufu's eldest son. While some argue that Mastabas could have been originally intended for the Western Cemeteries, the construction of the Eastern Cemetery likely paralleled that of the Western Cemeteries. The timing and planning for both would have been essential. The construction of Mastabas would not have significantly diverted resources from Kufu's pyramid. These structures, resembling Ford Model T cars with minimal embellishments, utilized various materials, including limestone cores and masonry retaining walls. Kufu's focus was undeniably on his pyramid, while the Mastabas seemed utilitarian and basic in comparison. GIA's elevated positioning on a rock protuberance reflects a conscious decision not to waste resources removing rock to the level of the temple. As the Queen's pyramids adapted to the sloping topography, their dimensions remain relatively unknown. The northwest corner of GIA, according to Maragiolio and Rinaldi, is two meters higher than the southeast corner, presenting challenges in measurement due to the slanting ground. As we examine the plan of GIA, provided by Maragiolio and Rinaldi, an interesting feature emerges, the somewhat trapezoidal shape of the structure. While Maragiolio and Rinaldi suggest a potential base of 90 cubits, Lena proposes an alternative theory, hinting that it may be one-fifth of Kufu's pyramid, measuring 88 cubits wide by 56 cubits high. Various measurements have been offered for these minor pyramids, and it would be intriguing to witness a more modern survey to settle the debate. Let's take a closer look at the discrepancies in these dimensions. The plan, as presented by Maragiolio and Rinaldi, indicates a slight displacement of the entrance to the east. This raises questions about the accuracy of previous measurements and emphasizes the need for a contemporary survey to shed light on the true dimensions of these structures. Lena's suggestion that GIA might be one-fifth of Kufu's pyramid introduces a fascinating twist to the discussion. Could this trapezoidal shape hold clues to its purpose or significance in relation to the grandeur of Kufu's pyramid? In this captivating view, with the Great Pyramid standing majestically in the background, our focus is drawn to the sloping foundations on the pyramid's south side, near the boat pit. These foundations offer a glimpse into the engineering marvels of ancient Egypt, as they seem to slope downward but level off at the corners. Let's take a closer look at these sloping foundations. As we examine the intricate details, we can observe a deliberate design that not only showcases the skill of the ancient builders but also raises questions about the purpose behind this architectural choice. Adjacent to these sloping foundations lies the renowned boat pit, adding another layer to the archaeological puzzle. What secrets does the boat pit hold, and how does it connect to the unique foundations we see? To fully appreciate the mysteries before us, we'll explore the historical context of these sloping foundations and the boat pit. Could they be linked to the construction process, or do they hold a more symbolic meaning? Speculations abound, and we aim to uncover the truth. In this close-up image of the south side, the meticulous craftsmanship becomes evident. The sloping cuts, designed to receive casing stones, showcase a subtle variation. Notably, at the southwest corner, the slope levels off, a feature also observed in GIB. Maragiolio and Rinaldi's report highlights the unique cuts, with angles around 17 to 18 degrees and a foundation trench approximately 1.5 meters wide. Surviving only in archival images on the east side, the casing stones are a testament to the precision of ancient builders. Maragiolio and Rinaldi note the inclination of these stones, mirroring the slope of the cuts. Over time, the stones transitioned from an inclined position to a horizontal one, cleverly achieved through a course of wedge-shaped blocks. The uneven topography of the Giza site presented challenges, and the builders sought to anchor the casing stones securely. The attention to detail in the sloping cuts and the strategic use of wedges demonstrate their commitment to the enduring stability of this architectural marvel. Moving beyond the sloping cuts, the minor pyramids reveal stepped cores, an architectural feature that adds another layer of complexity. The faces of the steps, created with roughly squared local limestone blocks, act as retaining walls for smaller, less worked blocks. The exterior faces of the steps exhibit a distinctive angle of about 75 degrees, showcasing the precision in construction. Each core slightly steps back, creating the desired angle. Against these stepped cores, builders placed backing and casing stones, adding further sophistication to the structure. Examining the entrance to GIA, 
one can't help but admire the fine limestone used for the architrave and the side walls of the entrance passage. Maragiolio and Rinaldi provide dimensions for the wall blocks, with the entrance passage standing at about 1.2 meters in height. The large architrave, part of a group of four similar stones, weighs approximately 30 metric tons and spans a distance of 4.73 meters. A fascinating observation made by Maragiolio and Rinaldi adds to the mystery. They discovered ornamental bas reliefs near the top of the lower architrave, indicating that the block was repurposed from a destroyed building. Intriguingly, each visible architrave features a short, deep, and vertical notch along the descending corridor's side walls, an enigma that remains unexplained. Lena's work provides another layer to the puzzle. He highlights an alignment between GIA and Petrie's trial passages trench, suggesting a connection. The detailed survey of the Queen's Pyramid is crucial to confirming or disproving any potential links to Trench D. As we observe the neat vertical notch on the first architrave of GIA, we can't help but wonder if it aligns with the mysterious notches mentioned by Maragiolio and Rinaldi. The intricate details and reused elements raise questions about the pyramid's history and purpose. As we examine this view, a significant block, approximately 3.2 meters wide, stands above the entrance architrave placed edgewise. Maragiolio and Rinaldi suggest the possibility of two superimposed layers of architraves. What adds to the intrigue is the apparent notch on the upper architrave, a feature reminiscent of similar notches found on other monuments. These notches, also present on other structures, have sparked discussions among experts. Lena and Horst propose the intriguing idea that they might serve as crude axis markers. While this theory offers insight, Further research on these notches, wherever they appear, would undoubtedly contribute to a deeper understanding of their significance. The concept of axis markers raises questions about the alignment and purpose behind these notches. Could they have played a role in the construction process or held symbolic significance? Lena and Horace's suggestion provides a fascinating starting point, but the mystery persists. In this captivating view, we stumble upon what seems to be the surviving casing in the foreground of Pyramid GIA. Surprisingly, Maragiolio and Rinaldi did not document these findings. It's worth noting that the north side may have been concealed by debris during their investigations, as they mention the northern foundation trench being visible only near the western extremity. Deeper insights reveal that the northern side's visibility might have been hindered in Maragiolio and Rinaldi's time. They acknowledge that debris obstructed observations, and the modern road to the west of the Queen's Pyramid could have further complicated their view of the Queen's Pyramids on this side. The mystery deepens as we ponder why these casing details went unnoticed for so long. Was it an oversight, or did the conditions on the northern side play a role in concealing this crucial aspect of GIA's structure? In this intriguing sketch from Howard Weiser's publication, we get a glimpse of how the entrance to Pyramid GIA looked in 1837. Pay close attention to the noticeable notches on both architraves, a feature that has puzzled researchers for years. These notches, clearly visible on the architraves, raise questions about their purpose and significance. What was the reason behind incorporating such detailed elements into the design of the entrance? Were they purely decorative, or did they serve a functional role? As we delve into Weiser's observations, it becomes evident that these notches were present even in the 19th century. Their consistent appearance over time adds to the enigma surrounding GIA's architecture. Imagine standing at the entrance of Pyramid GIA in 1837, witnessing these notches firsthand. Did Vise, too, wonder about their purpose? The enduring nature of this detail begs us to question its significance. The substructure. The descending passage, as documented by Howard Vise and confirmed by Maragiolio and Rinaldi, descends at an angle of 33-35. According to Maragiolio and Rinaldi, its original length was approximately 19.25-19.50 meters. Petrie, on the other hand, notes the passage azimuth as 14 feet 40 plus 20. The passage bore adheres to the standard seen in many pyramids, approximately 1.05 meters wide by 1.21 meters high, a measurement first observed in the Red Pyramid at Darshaw. Petrie's keen eye also noticed a slight narrowing at the bottom of the passage, measuring 40 inches compared to 41.5 inches further up. The precision in these measurements reflects the meticulous planning and execution of the ancient architects. 
Maragiolio and Rinaldi provide additional insights into the well-worked and dressed rock cut part of the passage. Notches, although not original, are present on the floor, strategically placed to facilitate transit. As we venture to the bottom of the descending passage, a short horizontal passage awaits, matching the dimensions of its vertical counterpart. At the junction of the ceilings, we observe a carefully cut section of rock, possibly designed to assist in clearance at this crucial point. The precision and engineering marvels hidden within these passages continue to astound researchers and enthusiasts alike. After the short horizontal passage, we enter into what effectively serves as a turning chamber, allowing ample space for large items to turn west and then descend down a short passage into the burial chamber. The turning chamber expands to about 1.77 meters wide and approximately 4.25 meters in length, with its highest point at the south end reaching around 2.94 meters. The floor starts to descend at an angle of 29-30 feet from its northern end. While the floor is much broken at its southern end, if it continued to the flat floor of the chamber, it would be around 3.68 meters long, aligning with the north wall of the short descending passage. Beyond the short horizontal passage, we enter a chamber that effectively serves as a turning chamber to allow ample space for large items to turn west and then descend down a short, descending passage into the burial chamber. To facilitate the turning of a sarcophagus, the east wall is further cut into by 0.52 meters for about 2.0 meters north to south and 1.80 meters high. On the east wall at floor level, there is a narrow groove about 60 centimeters high and 22 centimeters wide, along with a hole in the floor, about 38 centimeters deep and 18 centimeters in diameter. The use of this circular hole seems to be for holding a stout post, around which ropes could be passed to control the coffer when sliding it down the lower passage. In this aerial view, we gaze down into the turning chamber. To the right, you can see the passage that leads to the burial chamber. Take notice of the wall lining, a subtle yet crucial element in the chamber's design. In the foreground, observe how the inclined floor terminates, creating a significant gap. This gap is skillfully bridged by wooden floorboards that extend to the flat floor of the turning chamber. Now, let's focus on the cut recess visible on the east wall, strategically crafted to aid in turning the sarcophagus. As we examine closely, a smaller recess on the top edge comes into view. Remarkably regular, Maragiolio and Rinaldi assert that it's not a break. Surprisingly, this detail was not mentioned by Petrie. In this captivating view, we're peering north out of the turning chamber along the short horizontal passage. Just ahead, you'll notice the wooden boards thoughtfully placed to assist tourists in navigating the entrance passage. What secrets does this passage hold? Let's find out. As we see the way along the northern passage, observe the wooden boards, a modern addition to facilitate the exploration experience. These boards lead the way for those venturing into the mysteries of Pyramid GIA. Isn't it fascinating how ancient history and modern exploration converge? Burial chamber, in this captivating view, we find ourselves within the burial chamber, a cavernous excavation with rough dimensions of 5.15 meters EW, 4.35 meters NS, and a towering 3.45 meters high. What lies within this void? And what stories do the walls tell? Let's delve into the details. The burial chamber reveals a fascinating blend of meticulous craftsmanship and architectural economy. Fine limestone lining adorns the walls, pavement, and roofing beams oriented north-south. Notice the clever use of rock excavation, with areas deliberately left untouched in both floor and ceiling. This economic design mirrors certain aspects found in other Queen's burial chambers. However, the passage of time has not spared the lining, with a considerable amount missing, likely the result of ancient looting. According to Petrie, the thickness of the wall courses varies, and ledges on the east and west sides suggest the resting place for roofing beams. Yet, mysteries abound. What happened to the pavement, and where was the sarcophagus placed? Join us in the quest for answers. Speculations linger as Vise mentions a possible recess on the western side for a sarcophagus. Fragments of polished basalt add to the enigma, sparking thoughts of connections to Kufu's pyramid temple. What secrets do these fragments hold? And how do they tie into the broader narrative of Pyramid GIA? As we gaze into the southwest corner, the view reveals remnants of the original lining that still cling to their place, echoing the craftsmanship of ancient hands. 
Take note of the unexplored, untouched bar of rock along the ceiling of the western wall, holding within it the untold stories of ages past. As we zoom in on the detailed image of the southwest corner, a striking feature comes into focus, the presence of red construction lines. Regrettably, such lines are frequently overlooked in documentation, with only a few instances recorded by Petrie, notably in GIB. Yet, these seemingly mundane lines hold invaluable insights into the construction methods employed by ancient artisans. It's important to note that dimensions for the line chamber vary among different authors, introducing intriguing variations, particularly in width and height. Does this simple revelation carry information about the construction process? The varied dimensions of the burial chamber seem peculiar for a room of this small size, especially with the remaining stone pavement. We need a more detailed study using all available clues, such as unrecorded construction lines, to arrive at a better estimate of the chamber's size. Could the construction variability in dimensions be a sign of a specific stage in the building process? Are there buried secrets in these differences? Let's try to understand the story the stones tell us, with the help of unrecorded construction lines and other evidence. The dimensions of the burial chamber remain mysterious, but with future studies and deeper investigations, we may discover more about how this unique place was built. Behold the entrance in the east wall of the burial chamber, where the lining blocks on the north wall reveal a unique layout. The upper course differs in size from the lower, and the north rock wall holds an intriguing excavation reported as an air channel by Vice. The substructure design of Pyramid G1A stands out among its counterparts, GIB and GIC. While sharing similarities, it features a descending passage leading to a turning chamber, ultimately granting access to the burial chamber. Notably, G1A's passage enters in the northeast corner, setting it apart from the others. Delving deeper into the mysteries, Maragiolio and Rinaldi suggest a reason for the eccentric position of the crypt. The rock in the northwest quadrant of the base was higher, providing enhanced stability for the superimposed masonry and better defense for the crypt. A similar eccentricity can be observed in two of Mycerinus's queen's pyramids, adding to the intrigue. Here's a partial snapshot from Maragiolio and Rinaldi's plan of Pyramid G1A. We see the maze of passages and step chambers, noting that the burial ground is situated in the southwest quadrant. Could this unusual location be the key to unraveling the secrets of the pyramid? Moving south from the pyramid, we encounter a boat pit, shaped as if to receive a boat's keel. No boat fragments were found, only dry masonry walls from a later date that divided the pit into compartments. Behold! The image of the boat pit at Pyramid G1A, a relic from ancient times. Notice the meticulous construction and its unique design, shaped as if to cradle the keel of a boat. This discovery opens a window into the past, but there's more to the story. Now, let's compare this ancient image with a modern one. The masonry walls surrounding the pit are evident, and it appears they might have been linked to intrusive burials. What secrets do these walls hold? Could they be connected to the enigmatic boat pit? As we unravel the layers of history, the boat pit raises questions. Were there once boats resting within its confines, serving a ceremonial or practical purpose? Could the masonry walls be connected to later burials, adding another layer of mystery to this ancient site? In our quest to understand Pyramid G1A's boat pit, we find ourselves pondering the mysteries of the past. The juxtaposition of ancient images and modern observations sparks curiosity, leaving us with more questions than answers. Those mysterious excavations near Pyramid G1 are PKR curiosity. They hold secrets about ancient boats and perhaps even the symbolic significance behind their presence. Were these excavations holding actual boats, or were they symbolic representations? Let's take a closer look at the intricate design of the boat excavations. The ledges around the pits for cover stones provide additional clues about these structures. Could the presence of these excavations be linked to ancient traditions? With each detail revealed by the boat excavations, questions continue to surround them. Were these boats of symbolic importance, or were they part of burial rituals? Are there more hidden discoveries waiting for us? Behold the mysterious hole at the west end of the boat pit cover stone. What purpose could it have served? Was it an original feature or a result of later interventions? The answers lie shrouded in the sands of time. Let's delve into the details of the cover stone. Its position and the carefully cut hole with a rebate around it raise intriguing questions. 
Could it be a glimpse into the rituals or practices of ancient times? Or does it hold a connection to more recent activities? As we explore this archaeological anomaly, it's crucial to consider the context. Could the whole be linked to later intrusive activities, or does it reveal a hidden layer of the pyramid's history? The mysteries deepen as we seek to uncover the truth. While detailed information on this pit is elusive, we turn to experts and scholars for their perspectives. What do they think about the purpose of this mysterious hole? Could it hold clues to the broader mysteries of Pyramid G1A? Concluding this thrilling journey into the realm of the GIA Pyramid, we find ourselves immersed in the depths of mysteries and ancient history. Together, we explored every angle and facet of this unique pyramid, uncovering secrets hidden among its stones. The GIA Pyramid is not merely an ancient structure, it is a symbol of a civilization that stretched across the ages. It silently speaks to us about the technology, art, and creativity of those who preceded us on this grand land. We hope you enjoyed this journey with us and left your mark in the world of mysteries and exploration. Join us for more historical adventures as we reveal the secrets of ancient Egypt and shine a light on its fascinating history. Thank you for your viewership, and don't forget to subscribe and leave your comments for all the latest updates. Until we meet again on our next journey into the heart of Egyptian history. Farewell.